Hello students, how are you all? Hope you all are well and fine and I believe you all had a very great time with your family members. I also believe you are anxiously waiting for your result and I hope you have done your exam well. So to refresh your mind, we will start a new lesson again. And this lesson is taken from History, Chapter 3, The Students of Delhi. To start with the topic, I'd like to give a brief view on the establishment of Delhi Sultanate in India. Who was the main mastermind behind the establishment of Delhi Sultanate in India? We'll see them one after the another. Muhammad Ghori, the ruler of Ghor dynasty, wanted to extend his territory right up to North India. In this quest, he came into conflict with Prithvi Raj Chauhan and eventually led to the First Battle of Tehran in 1911, where Prithvi Raj Chauhan defeated Ghori. Okay, so, but in 1192, the Second Battle of Tehran proved to be the turning point in Indian history because in this battle, Muhammad Ghori attained an absolute victory and led the foundation of Delhi Sultanate, which ruled the country from 1206 to 1526. I repeat once again, although between uh, although Muhammad Ghori was defeated in the first battle of Tehran, but in the second battle of Tehran, he defeated Pitvi Raj Chauhan, and this turned to be a turning point in Indian history because through this Battle of Tehran, Muhammad Ghori established the Delhi Sultanate in India it, that started from 1206 to 1526. Okay? Now, this period saw the rule of five powerful dynasties. Now, one by one, Slave Dynasty, 1206 to 1290. Second one is Kalji Dynasty, started from 1290 to 1320. Third, Tughlaq Dynasty, 1320 to 1414. Next, Said Dynasty, 1414 to 1451. And lastly, Lodi Dynasty, 1451 to 1526. So, we will see these five powerful dynasty, one of the another, who were the rulers, what were the administration that they all carried on. Okay? So, to start with the topic, the first one will be the slave dynasty and as you see in the indian map all this purple color okay these are the empires or these are the kingdoms that was occupied by the during the slave dynasty okay now the first one is when Muhammad Ghori died in 1206, his most trusted slave, Qutub Uddin Aibak, became the chief of his territories in India. Remember students, Qutub Uddin Aibak was also a slave under Muhammad Ghori and he was the chief commander under his territory. Okay? Now, Aibak is considered to be the founder of the Malmuk dynasty. The term Malmuk means slave or owned. Therefore, this dynasty is also known as the slave dynasty. Next. Kutub Uddin Aibak. Now we will see who was this Kutub Uddin Aibak. Now, when Kutub Uddin Aibak ascended the throne, he realized that a new kingdom was vulnerable both to internal and external threat, so he used matrimonial alliances to strengthen his position. So he married the daughter of Yaldos, governor of Iran, and he let her daughter marry his most trusted slave, Idumish, who later succeeded him. Aibak was known for his generosity and kind heartedness, so he was given the name Lakbash or Giver of Legs. Now, when Qutub Uddin Aibak came to the throne, he saw and realized that his kingdom was in danger both internally and externally. So, in order to make his relationship strong, okay, in order to make his kingdom strong, he started to follow the policy of matrimonial alliances. Matrimonial alliances means making a strong relationship through marriages. So, he married a daughter of governor of Iran, okay, Yaldos, and also let his daughter marry his most trusted slave, Idumish, who later succeeded him. Now, this Aibak, Kutim Uddin Aibak, was also known for his generosity and kindness, so he was given the name Lakpash, or giver of legs, okay, please remember that. Now, next, he also built two mosques, that is, Kuwat ul Islam and Atai Tinka Jorbar. He even started the construction of Qutub Minar, but he could not complete it. Okay? His rule did not add to the Turkish conquest in India and died in 1210 when he fell off a horse while playing polo. Qutub Uddin Aibak was neither killed nor murdered by anyone, but he died from his own horse okay, while playing polo. Okay? Now, Next is Idumish. 
Shamshuddin Itamish was the son-in-law of Aibak. He is regarded as the real founder of the Delhi Sultanate. He shifted the seat of governance from Lahore to Delhi. Thus, Delhi came to occupy the premier, uh, premier position as the capital of Hindustan. Today, the capital city of India, Delhi, the credit got to this person Itamish because he was the one who brought okay, the slave dynasty, which was once in Lahore. He was the one to bring it back to Delhi. So from there, Delhi was recognized as the capital of Hindustan, which is also known as India, which is followed even today. So the real mastermind behind this is this Itamish. Now next, he faced many rebellions during his rule, but he crushed most of them. His uh, thus consolidated his position and extended his control till the Indus and the whole of Muldan and Sindh. Towards the east, he extended his control over Lagnadi, that is in Bihar and Bengal. He even brought under his control the Rajput territories of Vanaya, Ajmer and Sambad. He created an entire new class of ruling allied called the Jalisa or the Group of Forty. Please remember, this Itimush also created a new class known as Chalisa, which is also known as the Group of Forty. The death of Itimush was followed by political instability in Delhi, which saw acute struggle amongst nobility. Okay. Now next is Razia Sudana. Itimish has nominated his daughter Razia to succeed him. However, after the death of Itimish, his son Ruknitin Firo succeeded the throne. But Ruknitin incompetence and unpopularity gave Razia an opportunity to claim the throne. But Razia did not enjoy the support of the Turkish noble. Eventually, with her political skill, Razia won over majority of the opposing leaders and succeeded the throne. Okay, students, Razia Sultana was the daughter of Itimish. So before he died, he nominated her to be the next queen. But after the death of Itimish, his son Ruknitin Feroz came to the throne. But because of his incompetence and unpopularity, he gave opportunity to Razia to claim the throne. So what happened was, when Razia came to the throne, the nobles and the minister did not support her because she was a woman. But because of her political skills, braveness, okay, she won the majority heart of the opposing leaders and that's how she came back to the Thorn. Razia put on the tunic and headdress of men's attire for day-to-day -day administration. She even abandoned the wheel. Okay, we all know that Muslim ladies, their culture, their customs is supposed to put a wheel. So what happened is that she even abandoned the custom and traditions by abandoning the wheel. She never put the wheel because she was a queen on the throne, right? And she has to look after the kingdom. So whenever she sits on the throne, she was she used to dress up like a dress uh, she used to dress up like a man's attire okay she will put up a man's attire so that okay so that the nobles and the ministers and his subjects will not pinpoint on her so in that way razia sultana okay gave her best to look after the kingdom in her rule she appointed a non-turkish and abstinent slave malik yakut as the superintendent of the stables this encouraged the turkish nobles there was rebellion in delhi and elsewhere in the kingdom thus the chalisa conspired and killed her in 1240 so during her time she appointed a non-turkish okay, please remember a non-muslim called malik yakut and she gave him the superintendent of the stable so when she appointed him the nobles became angry and that's how the rebellion started in the kingdom and the chalisa that is the group of 40 they made a plan they plot against her and killed her in 12 now the next is Nasruddin Mahmud. Nasruddin Mahmud was just a figure hat king. The real power was wielded by his chief minister Jayasuddin Balban. On the death of Nasruddin, Balban became the king. Are your students here? I would like to focus on. Like in India, the president is just a nominal hat where all the power rests. All the powers are in the hands of the prime minister and his council of ministers, right? In the same way, Nasruddin Mahmud was just a figure hat king. He was just a nominal king where all the real powers was in the hands of the chief minister. Jayasuddin Balban. So after the death of Nazaruddin Mahmud, Balban became the next king. Now we will see in detail who was Jayasuddin Balban. Balban's ascendancy to the throne marked the beginning of an era which was characterized by centralized governance. He adopted the Iranian theory of kingship and according to this theory, the king was divine and was the shadow of God on earth and hence must be obeyed. 
Okay, now Balban, okay, he adopted Iranian theory. And what is this Iranian theory? According to this Iranian theory, the king was a god, like a god on earth. Okay, the king represented like a god on earth. And hence, everybody must obey him. And if anyone fails to obey the king, that means they are disrespecting the god on heaven. So that was the belief according to this Iranian theory okay now next he also introduced prussian custom of sujas and balbos he followed a policy of blood and iron and crushed any rebellion with a heavy hand he kept the nobility under strict control and created a strong spy system to keep them in check now, Balban brought many reforms in the internal administration. He enforced law and order and reorganized the army, constructed roads and made arrangements for interstate traffic. Judicial was strengthened, information on tax collection process, and provincial governors were frequently transferred. But he could not successfully suppress the rebellion in Bengal. Under Durkil, Balban died in 1287 and the slave dynasty came to an end within three years of his death. Although Balban was very powerful, he failed in one area and that is he failed to suppress the rebellion in Bengal under the leadership of Durkil and he was killed in 1287 and with the death of Balban, the slave dynasty came to an end. And in 1290, Jalaluddin Khalji, the governor of Samana, occupied Delhi by military coup and declared himself as a sultan. Thus led to a new dynasty, the Khalji dynasty. Now we will see in detail and the rulers one by one after the another under the Khalji dynasty. And students, like I said, you have seen this purple mark in the map. These are all the kingdoms that was occupied under the Khalji dynasty. Okay. Now the Khalji or Khalji's dynasty was a Muslim dynasty which ruled on the Delhi Sultanate, covering large part of the Indian subcontinent for nearly three decades. Founded by Jalaluddin Firuz Khalji as the second dynasty to rule Delhi Sultanate of. Now we will see who was Jalaluddin Khalji. Jalaluddin Khalji observed the throne by killing Balban's grandson. During his reign, the Mongols invented in 1292. But after some skirmishes, the Mongols decided to withdraw without a fight. Okay. Now next, Aladdin Khalji occupied the throne by murdering Jalaluddin Khalji. Aladdin did not believe in Jalaluddin's theory of benevolence. He adhered to Balban's theory of administration through evoking fear. He revived the system of spies of Balban. Aladdin culture is regarded as the greatest of the Delhi Sultanate monarchs. He vigorously pursued an imperial policy based on Chakravartin principle of ancient India. Aladdin unified the whole country and brought it under the control of a powerful central government. Gujarat, Rajasthan, Malwa, modern day Maharashtra, and the Deccan under the control of Delhi or elsewhere compelled to accept Delhi's vassalage. Aladdin increased the armed forces and secularized the state politics and threw open the public services to the commanders, irrespective of their religion. Aladdin Khalji was the son of Jalaluddin Khalji and he sat on the throne by murdering his own father. Why? Because Jalaluddin in nature was a he always believed in the theory of benevolence. Benevolence means a kind heartedness, okay? A soft person who did not believe in wars. But his son Aladdin Khalji always believed in war, okay? And he always followed the policy of Balban's theory, the Peranian theory, right? Persian theory. So what he did was he killed his own father and occupied the throne and he revived all the policy once again. Okay, he overthrew all his father's policy and he made, he refreshed all the new laws for the, his kingdom. Okay, now the next uh, Aladdin Khalji policies of administrations. Now we will see what are the policies okay, of Aladdin Khalji and the first is land revenue policy. Now under this land revenue policy, we will see that to increase the revenue of the state, Aladdin took some stringent measures so we'll see what are the measures that aladdin took in order to increase the revenue of the state first is he confiscated all the uh, rent free land that was gifted to the nobles priests etc and added them to the state land second all land was properly assessed and the revenue demand of the state was fixed at one third of the produce. Thirdly, in fertile areas like the Ganga Yamuna Dwab, the land revenue was fixed as high as half of the total produce. The land revenue could be paid in cash or kind. Officials were strictly forbidden to charge extra revenue from the citizens. Okay. Now, 
The next point is market regulations. This also will come under the uh, policy administrations of Aladdin Kalji. Okay. Now, under these market regulations, Aladdin was a far-sighted monarch and well aware of the benefits of having fixed prices. Thus, he put a check on the prices so that the soldiers could not live within their income. Prices of essential commodities were subsidized and fixed. Separate markets were established under the supervision of market superintendents. There were separate markets for separate goods, food grains, clothes, slaves, horses, cattle, and imported goods. These markets were under constant surveillance and harsh punishments were meted to those who cheated. The weight and balances of the margins were constantly checked. Aladdin maintained an efficient system of spices for this. Now, these are the some of the measures that was taken by Aladdin Kalji when it comes under the regula uh, market regulations. Now, next is reorganization army. Aladdin was great effort to Aladdin made a great effort to reorganize and reform his forces. He was the first to introduce the concept of fulia or a descriptive role of each soldier. Further, he introduced the branding of the horses with a royal insignia called the tag. Next is Mubarak Kalji. A war of succession ensured after the death of Aladdin Kalji in 1316. Malik Kafur, the Malik Nab or wise regent, eliminated his opponent as well as the heir apparent Chris Khan and assumed all powers. However, the nobles overthrew him in a month's time. Mubarak Kalji ascended the throne after that in order to gain popularity. He abolished all the ecocran and market control regulation of Aladdin. He tried to maintain the position of Aladdin Kalji on Tikan and Gujarat by sending expeditions there. However, he was challenged and overthrown by Jayasudin Duglak, the governor of Dilapur in Punjab and founded the Duglak dynasty. Now, in this, okay, the last ruler of Kalji dynasty was this Mubarak Kalji and he was being defeated by Jayasudin Duglak, okay, who founded the Duglak dynasty later on. Now we, now, we will see the next dynasty, that is the Duglak dynasty. And as you can see, all these purple marks, again, okay, Indian map, these are the kingdoms that was occupied under this Tughlaq dynasty. Now, the Tughlaq dynasty also refers to as Tughlaq or Tughlaq dynasty, was the Muslim dynasty which ruled over the Delhi Sudanate in medieval time of India. Its reign started in 1320 in Delhi when Ghazni Malik assumed the throne under the title of Jiyad al Din Tughlaq, and the dynasty ended in 14. 13. Okay. Now we will see one by one its rulers and its administrations. The first is Jaya Sudin Tughlaq. He ascended the throne in 1320 and reorganized the administration. He sent his son Uluk Khan to restore imperial position in Warangal. He sent a noble to deal with rebellion in Gujarat. He himself marched to Bengal to reduce it to submission. On his return from the successful campaign, a pavilion was erected by his son Uluk Khan to welcome him, but the pavilion crushed and crushed him to death. Now, next is Muhammad bin Duglak. Muhammad bin Duglak ascended the throne at Dugladabad, the fortified residence of the decreased father. He was the most educated of all preceding sultans of Delhi Sultanate. He was well versed in Persian, Arabic, Turkish, and even Sanskrit. He was well read in the subjects of astronomy, philosophy, mathematics, medicine, and logic. He undertook several experiments. Most were ill planned and failed. His experiments emptied the royal treasury. Under his rule, there were outbreaks of rebellions in different parts of the kingdoms which he failed to control. He died while he was on a campaign to Tatha. Next, Perosha Duglak. Muhammad bin Duglak did not have any hair. Okay, hair means he doesn't have his own son, and neither did he nominate anyone. So the sheikhs, nobles, and ulema elected Perosha Duglak, cousins of Muhammad bin Duglak, to the he tried to revive the tradition of a state based on goodwill and welfare of its people as visualized by Jalaluddin Khalji, so he followed a policy of accomplishment of different sections. He led two campaigns to Bengal, raided Orissa and Nagarkot, and a campaign to Lower Sindh. He founded the city of Hisar and decided to take two canals to bring water to the city from Satlut and Jamuna. He set up a separate department for the upliftment of the poor and needy. He also introduced the practice of all age pension and open and employment pure. Next, slave uh, so sorry, side dynasty. Now these are the kingdoms, okay? These are the kingdoms, this red area. These are the kingdoms which was occupied under the side dynasty. The side dynasty was a fourth dynasty of the Delhi Sudanate. 
with four rulers ruling from 1414 to 1451. Now the first ruler is Chris Khan. The Sai dynasty was established by Chris Khan. He was appointed by Daimur to be the governor of Muldan, which is in Punjab. He took control over Delhi on May 28, 1414 and founded the Sai dynasty. So please remember this uh, Chris Khan was a founder of this Sai dynasty. Now next, Mubarak Shah Shahid. Chris Khan was succeeded by his son Mubarak Khan. He styled himself as Moiz Uddin Mubarak Khan Shah in his coins. He spent most of the time of his rule in controlling the rebellion of the nobles. Next is Muhammad Shah Shahid. After the death of Mubarak Khan, his nephew Mubar Muhammad Khan ascended the throne and styled himself as Sultan Muhammad Shah. The next, Aladdin Alam Shah Shahid. Aladdin Alam from Bhutan was nominated to the throne by Muhammad Shah before his death to be the successor. He was the last ruler, ruler of the Said dynasty. Students, please remember Aladdin Alam Shah was the last ruler of the Said dynasty. It was Aladdin Alam who voluntarily abdicated the throne in favor of Bulbul Khan Lodi in 1451 and left for Bhutan. He continued to live there till his death in 1478. So, this Aladdin Alam Shah, he gave the kingdom. Okay, to Baul Khan Lodi and he left for Bhutan. He voluntarily stepped down from his throne and handed over the Baul Khan Lodi. Okay, and he went for Bhutan. Now, with that, the Lodi dynasty came to India. And this, the purple area which you can see, these are the kingdoms that was occupied under the Lodi dynasty. The Lodi dynasty was the Afghan dynasty that ruled the Delhi Sultanate from 1451 to 1526. It was the last dynasty of the Delhi Sultanate. Students please remember this Lodi dynasty was the last dynasty of the Delhi Sultanate. So now let's see its ruler one after the another. First is Babul Lodi. In 1451, Babul Lodi, an Afghan chief, established the Lodi dynasty. He suppressed rebellions and installed, installed lo loyal Afghan nobles in strategic positions. He extended the boundaries of the Sultanate to parts of Punjab and Bihar. Next is Sikandar Lodi. Nizam Shah or Sikandar Lodi was another powerful ruler of the Lodi dynasty who extended the boundaries till Bihar and Bengal. He undertook the welfare measures like lowering the prices of commodities. Under his reign, Agra became the capital city of the empire. Next, Ibrahim Lodi. Ibrahim Lodi was the last ruler of the Delhi Sultanate. It was said that he was an arrogant ruler and treated the Afghan nobles with little respect. In retaliation, the noble invited Papur, the ruler of Kapul, to invade India. Papur met Lodi in the first battle of Panipat in 1526 and defeated the latter, leading to the establishment of the Mughal Empire in India. So this is the end of the five dynasties that was powerful five dynasties that was established in India. Okay. Now we will see what was the type of administration of the Delhi Sultanate. Okay. The first is the machinery of administration that involved under the Delhi Sultanate was inspired by the Abdasis. So it was theoretic in character and the Delhi Sultanate was an Islamic state. The head of the state was regarded as the religious leader of the people. Please remember the head of the state was regarded as the religious leader of the people. It was believed that he derived his authority from God. Some of the institutions under Delhi Sultanates are... The Sultans, the Sultans of Delhi were independent ruler of the territory. All powers of the state were concentrated in the hands of the Sultan. Ministers, he assisted the Sultan. Wazir was the Prime Minister. Arzid e Mamalik was responsible for defense. Divan e Insha was responsible for records of the royal courts. Provincial and local governments, the territories of the Sultanates were broadly divided into two parts, the Khalsa or land under the direct administrative control of the center and the Jagirs, which was land under independent Hindu chiefs. Now we will see the military organizations under the Sultanate. The army comprised of infantry, cavalry, and war elephants. The soldiers used bows and arrows, spears, swords, battle axes, draggers, shields, and protective headgears. The horseman and his horse were protected by iron covers and iron shields. Elephants were also used for quick transportations of armaments and soldiers. Capulets and such other mechanical devices were used for hurtling big stones on enemies. Now, 
the last topic we will see decline and disintegration of delhi sultanate how did the delhi sultanate came to an end okay the first point no single emperor can be held responsible for the disintegration of the delhi sultanate Second point, there were numerous powerful nobles who had either a clan following of their own or strong link with a particular region. Third, these clans or link always rebelled when they sensed any weaknesses in their central authority. Fourth, there were struggles for succession in which ambitious nobles found opportunity to further their interests. Fifth, each of these groups were incapable to the unity of Sultanate. Sixth, the Delhi Sultanate period witnessed a centralized and militaristic state with factional ruling class. 7. This class later arose a new regional and provincial state and became a great kingdom in due course of time like Bahamani and Vijayanagar. So students, this is the detailed explanations of the Sultans of Delhi. If you have any problem regarding any topic, please feel free to contact or call me anytime. Till then, take care, stay safe and see ya.